Just some images of, of Sibley Hall. And I, I put this one in here just because, look how long, we don't build buildings like this anymore, do we? I mean, look at that. Look at all the wood paneling and the marble flooring. It, it's just really quite wonderful. And I think, how can we tear, you know, how can we tear something like that down? But, but we did. <laughs> we did. You know? It was, the, it was the 1960s. We weren't interested in preservation as we are today. A reading room. Oh, and here is this mineralogical and uh, uh, zoological on the second floor that was Professor Fairchild, for whom we have a... Uh, he was a professor of geology here. I don't know what's happened with all this stuff. That's in, I mean, what in the world they do with all that? You How know? In the Todd Union, is that... In, in Todd Union lobby, there is a dinosaur like that. Do we have that in Todd? Where in Todd? It's not a real dinosaur. In Todd Theater. Oh, in Todd Theater, yeah. I don't think that's the... the is that... I don't, well, that's a good question. Was that given to us recently? Oh, okay. I mean, it's been there for a while. I doubt that it is that it's that original. Um, so, so um, th this is a building that went up for for Professor Lattimore, a chemistry building. I'll move it right along. Now, here is David Jane Hill. David Jane Hill was our second president. It was he who allowed football to come. Now, with David Jane Hill coming in 1889, he was the shortest the shortest term of any of our presidents. He was had been the president of Bucknell University. He came to us in 18 was appointed in 1888 came in 1889. By the way, President Anderson died in 1889. Um, but what was important about David Jane Hill was, Im imagine trying to follow on the heels, the leadership responsibilities of, of following on the heels of someone who had served for 35 years. David Jane Hill's responsibility was to usher in the new century, and that's really what he did, by modernizing the curriculum. He was responsible for helping to modernize the curriculum, and to, uh, and do, and to do that in part by offering students greater choice by offering students greater opportunity to make decisions, intellectual, academic decisions for themselves. He also, while not a fan of co-education, he was not opposed to it. And there's this anecdote about him which, in which he is alleged to have said when, when he was here, his wife gave birth to twins, a boy and a girl. And he is alleged to have said that if the male and female can coexist in the womb for nine months peacefully, they ought to be able to do it in the classroom as well. <laughs> so I, I, I'm, I, I don't know if, that's, if he really said that or not, but it's sort of a, an amusing little anecdote. Um, so he was here until 1896. He left. He became a very distinguished and important um, diplomat. He was, he was a scholar, an intellectual, and, a, and an American diplomat. And uh, he went off into the diplomatic service for the United States. This is our first African-American graduate, Charles Augustus Thompson, who graduated in 1892. And he, uh, after, he, after graduation, he went to um, Washington, D.C., where he was a Presbyterian minister. And he went to Howard University for two years to get a certification to be a chiropractor. And that's where he lived out his life. Now, I don't have a whole lot of time, but I want to, to spend a few minutes talking about what I think was the most astonishing period in our history. When you talk about the pursuit, in, indefeasible and rigorous pursuit of quality of the highest order, and the identification and cultivation of inspired and effective leadership, it doesn't get any better than what happened with the arrival of, does anybody know who this is? This is Rush Reese, our third president. With him, he served for 35 years. Arthur May in his history tells us that the first third were terrible. The second third, things improved a little bit. And the final third, things really started to happen. And I just want to tell you what some of those things were because even to this day, as much as, as familiar as I have become with the history, I'm, I'm in awe of what this man, this woman, and, and the, a third individual, George Eastman, did on behalf of the university because these people really made us who we are today and it is on their shoulders that we here uh, that we here stand. Um, Susan B. Anthony. Now what is Susan B. Anthony famous for as far as we're concerned? Uh, 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 the admission of women. Now um, um, she argued, she argued vociferously that, that the University of Rochester, it was the place of highest quality where, where uh, the opportunities for higher education for women should be pursued. So the Board of Trustees listened to her arguments and said, okay, oh, by the way, let me just back up a minute. I told you about 1852 in Barleywood Female University. Another attempt was made in 1873 to create a university for women. It failed as well. But in, in the late 1890s. Miss Anthony made the argument to the trustees that women should be admitted in 1898, and 
um, the trustees heard her arguments and said to her, we will consider the admission of women, but resources matter. And in order to do that, you and your friends are going to have to raise $100,000. Now, $100,000 in 1898 just adjust that for inflation. It's like saying it's a, a billion dollars. It's a lot of money. Ms. Anderson declared victory before she had raised her first dollar, and she and her friends went out went out into the community to raise $100,000. And the trustees gave them two years to do it. They wanted it done by 1900. In June of 1900, the women had raised but $40,000. They went back to the trustees and said, we've only been able to raise $40,000. Are you willing to renegotiate the treaty, uh, uh, the, renegotiate the goal? The trustees were willing to do it and made the goal $50,000. Raising that Additional ten thousand dollars was twice as hard as raising the first forty thousand. Why? Because they tapped out. They tapped so many people out. However, there were a few people who were willing to who were willing to cooperate, including Miss um, Anthony's sister, a very important um, Unitarian minister, and his wife by the name of Gannett, right? And Susan B. Anthony Gannett, not the not the newspaper publisher, but Gannett of the, the Unitarian minister, and you'll notice Gannett is in Susan B. Anthony, isn't it? All of those halls, all of those halls, what, what are the four halls in, in Susan B. Anthony? What are they named? Morgan named for Lewis Henry, right? Lewis Henry Morgan. Gannett, the wife of the Unitarian minister who contributed to this? Gates. Gates, yeah, and G Gates was a professor, and Hollister. I'm, I'm, hmm. <laughs> And so, but but they were able to raise they were able to raise it. But one of the one of the the gifts, a two thousand dollar gift, the trustees of the ten that they had yet to raise, two thousand of it the, the trustees disallowed because they thought it was uncollectible. Miss Anthony, to putting her money where her mouth was, surrendered the value, the cash value of her life insurance policy, which was valued at two thousand dollars, which took us to the, the total fifty thousand dollars, and the trustees voted to admit women. By the way, the, the campaign for women continued beyond uh, 1900, and the trustees, I'm so pleased to be able to report, the trustees returned Miss Anderson's life insurance policy to her. Um, so, now, the first woman, however, there's some intrigue here, because there were plans to have a woman secretively enroll as a matriculated student, and it was this woman, Helen Wilkinson. So Helen Wilkinson, Susan B. Anthony, worked worked a deal where Helen Wilkinson was going to enroll as a student in, in, in 1893. She spent two years preparing uh, to enroll as a student, but it was going to be kept quiet. It was not going to be broadcast. She was a brilliant student, and Susan B. Anthony was providing the support for her. So the plan was that she would spend two years, 1893, 1895, doing preliminary work to get herself ready to matriculate as a full-time student, but quietly out from under the watchful eyes of people who were, uh, who were opposed. She then did matriculate, and she would have graduated in 1897. The plan was for her to graduate in 1897, but sadly, she died that year. So Helen Wilkinson was not our first graduate. The first woman student to enroll at the University of Rochester in 1900 was Julia Frederica Seligman. When Joel and Frederica Seligman <laughs> came to the University of Rochester, he is our 10th president and she is his spouse, you can imagine our jaws just hit the floor when we saw this. And so we put our eager beavers in, in, uh, in rare books and special collections to the task. Who is this woman and is there any relationship to Joel Seligman? Well, there isn't, as a matter of fact. But, but there's a great story. Julia came and she, she sat on the steps of Anderson Hall. And uh, whoever was in, in the office at that time came out and said, Young lady, what are you doing here? And she said... Women, are, women have been admitted to the university, and I'm here to register. And so register she did and, um, in 1900, and she graduated in, uh, in 1904. So she's not our first graduate, but this woman is. This is Ella Salome Wilcoxon. And Ella came in 1900 also, but she came with a lot of college credit. And so she was able to graduate in 1901. Uh, she was a school teacher. She was from Madison, uh, not Madison. She was from Macedon, New York, uh, a, a town near here, and she became a school teacher. Uh, her brother graduated in 1892, um, and so she was she was our first graduate, and she lived until the 1950s, I believe. 
Uh, this was our first, this is the class of 04, but this is the first woman admitted to Phi Beta Kappa, Ruth Hogarth Dennis, and in that first class there were, I think, four women. And here is a piece of a letter from Susan B. Anthony in which she, uh, she's writing to, um, She's writing to someone, I, I like this, I, I didn't put the whole letter here, but she, uh, Susan B. Anthony says, Tell Mr. Dennis that his niece, Ruth Hogarth Dennis, that I just showed you, stood ahead of all the class and above the 200 boys in the college, double exclamation point. She graduated this year. I heard that Miss Dennis was up to Rochester in the spring, but she did not come to see me. I hope she won't fail to call if she comes here again. I liked her very much. Give my best love to your neighbors on your right and to those on your left. I'm not sure if that's a political statement or not. And if you have any in front of you to them, and believe me ever and always yours affectionately, Susan B. Anthony. This is our first African-American female graduate, Beatrice Amaza Howard, who was from Rochester, graduated from East High School, and as you can see, she was a scholar athlete uh, as well, an English major, and uh, she was a teacher. Her, her, as, her career was as a teacher. And then just a couple of pictures of the classes. This is, imagine having to wear that, right? You're just as happy you're in the, the class. What, what year are you, what class? Um, 2014. 2014. You'll take 2014 to 1906, uh, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, so this is the class of 06. This is our first woman faculty member. This is Elizabeth Denio. She taught art and art history. She did a PhD at the age of 52 at the University of Heidelberg. She was from Orleans County here, from a very wealthy family. Now, check this out. She first taught at the University of Rochester in 1902, but without benefit of salary or faculty rank. Her students actually had to go out and raise the money to to uh, provide her with compensation. Finally, in 1910, President Rush Rees gave her a faculty appointment and a salary, which, and she taught for the next seven years until 1917, at which point she retired. And then in 1922, she died. And interestingly enough, and sadly enough, she was struck by an automobile on East Avenue at the corner of East Avenue and um, Meg Street, East Avenue and Meg Street, right where Third Presbyterian Church is, and, and, uh, and uh, sadly she did not survive. This was the first woman dean, Annette Gardner Monroe. Do we, have a, do we have something named for her? Absolutely. Now the trustees did something really weird. Women got admitted in 1900 and we were a co-ed institution. There weren't many as you could see, but we were a co-ed institution. But the idea of co-education did not exist with real force at this time. The idea of the coordinate colleges did. Um, Hobart and William Smith, Harvard Radcliffe, Duke Trinity, Columbia Barnard. So the trustees in 1912 at the University of Rochester decided to create separate college for men and college for women. And this was the first building that opened in 1914 for women over on the Prince Street campus. Housing for men was really a very difficult problem. Uh, and so what they did, they lived in boarding houses or they lived um, in fraternity houses. And here's the DU house. This house doesn't exist anymore. I went over to check, and it doesn't exist anymore. But this house, this is at the corner of Strath Allen and University Avenue, directly across the street from the Memorial Art Gallery. And so um, guys in fraternities lived in houses. When we, when, when we came into existence in 1850, there were five fraternities that were established in those first years of our founding. Anybody want to guess what they were? DU obviously was one. Alpha Delta Phi was the first. Actually, Alpha Delta Phi, the, the, our Alpha Delta chapter existed before the university was founded because our first Alpha Delta members were students at Madison University and they wanted to become members of Alpha Delta, but, but Madison didn't have fraternities. So they went to Hamilton College to be initiated and then transferred to the University of Rochester. I got any Alpha Delts? Any Alpha Delts? Because the Alpha Delta brothers will tell you we were here before the University of Rochester was, so d put that in your pipe and smoke it. So, 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 so Delta Upsilon. Alpha Delta Phi, Deke, I'm sorry? Psi U, that's right, Psi U, and then Delta Psi, which doesn't, D Delta Psi is not, is not here. But they, they were founded in the, in the 1850s. M the Memorial Art Gallery, George Eastman, astonishing. George Eastman, George Eastman and his relationship with, his relationship with um, Rush Reese, uh, unlike any relationship ever. George Eastman was not an educated man. He dropped out of high school. He was born in Waterville, New York. He dropped out of high school because his, um, his, uh, his father died and he had to support the family. Made his way to Rochester, came to Rochester, and the rest is sort of his history as he founded the Eastman Dry Plate Company. It was the film company, Eastman Kodak, that became Eastman Kodak. And um, uh, 
but 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 George Eastman was not. Um, he, he was not particularly a fan of higher education, he wasn't a product of higher education, and he didn't understand what the relationship between the industrial commercial world and higher education was. His first gift to the university was in 1899, it was a camera. When Brush Reese came as our president, he recognized that the future in this community, the future of the University of Rochester, and quite frankly, uh, the, the Eastman Kodak Company, lay in the relationship that he forged, that the two of them forged. I have read the correspondence between Rush Reese and George Eastman, all of that. Thanks to Eileen, who has provided me with that, I have been able to read the correspondence, and it's an astonishing story. President Reese went to George Eastman in, in the early 1900s, 1902 maybe, to say, we need a, um, on the Prince Street campus, we need a physics and biology building. And so he asked Mr. Eastman to fund this physics and biology, he was hoping he would fund this physics and biology building. Well, this building, which still stands, it's still there. In fact, our Center for Community Health, in the Medical Center, now has its offices here. It's, it's, it's behind the Memorial Art Gallery. Do you know where the School of the Arts is? Are you familiar with that? It's across the street from the School of the Arts. So we wanted to build this building. The cost of construction and outfitting this physics and biology building was $77,000. And Russia was hoping against hope that, that Mr. Eastman would provide that. Eastman gave him a check for $10,000. Uh, and it's really interesting because George, Eastman's, George Eastman recognized that President Reese was a little disappointed. And he said to him, I sense that you are disappointed by my gift. Well, you don't look a gift horse in the mouth, right? And so President Reese finessed his response and took his leave, happy to have anything at all, even if it was less than what he had hoped for. Within a few days, President Reese received on his desk a check for $67,000 in full payment for what the anticipated cost of the building was. And George Eastman is alleged to have said, I gave him the balance of the construction and, and, and outfitting of the building because he didn't ask for it, which is really kind of interesting. The building actually ended up costing $15,000 more than uh, the original 77 and George Eastman covered the cost of that building as well. And the next time you're over in that neck of the woods, if you go over there and you look over this, you can drive into the driveway. The School of the Arts is over here. You can drive into the driveway here and over the building is the word Eastman. And it's the first building that we named for George Eastman. Still stands. This is the second building. It's called the Carnegie Building. And the Carnegie Foundation and Andrew Carnegie, this was, this was our first engineering building primarily mechanical and electrical engineering. That building is still there, and if you're familiar with Village Gate, you know Village Gate, you go, to, you go to Village Gate for Salinas or the Bob Shop, which is gonna move, I just heard. But if you're familiar with Village Gate, next time you go to Village Gate and you're on Goodman Street, just look up, you'll see it's right there. That building is there, it's largely unoccupied. Cutler Union. Um, Cutler Union was built in 1932 as the student union for the College for Women. I'll just move on, that's how it looks today. So, in 1918, George Eastman says to Rush Reese, how would you like a music school? Well, you know, Rush Reese knew at, by that point to say yes to whatever Mr. Eastman was interested in. So he said, sure. So this is in the days before mergers and acquisitions existed with any force. What does George Eastman do? He, bought, he went out and bought a music school. There was a music school that already existed in Rochester. It was called the DKG Institute of Musical Art. The DKG Institute of Musical Art, which stood for the names of its founders, Herman Dossenbach, Alf Klingenberg, and Oscar Gereisen, DKG. He bought it for $28,000 and he gave it to the university for a buck. And, and it was housed at 47 Prince Street, which is right where the School of the Arts is. So it was right part of the campus. What's really interesting is the original Eastman School of Music was part of, was part of or close to the university from its founding. In, it actually was founded in 1921. Eastman bought it in 1918. But from 1921, um, until the women from the College for Women moved to the River Campus in 1955. So there was a period of time when Eastman was, was a much more vibrant part of the university community. So at any rate, he bought it, gave it to the, to the, the university, and the Eastman School of Music has always been a part of the University of Rochester. And then he acquired, George Eastman acquired the land that we know, where we know the Eastman School is now, and began the construction of the school building itself and the Eastman Theater, which was to be a theater not only for music, but largely for silent films. Um, so, uh, and, and this is, as you can see, the date here is 1921. It was completed in September of 19, 1922, and it opened as one of, the most, one of the most ornate and glorious movie theaters and music houses in the United States. A funny little story. This building here, you see this building? 
George Eastman wanted to acquire that property as well. And the guy who owned it was willing to sell it to him as part of the complex. But George Eastman thought that the, what the guy was asking was exorbitant. So he said, he said, to hell with you, I'll just build my school and my theater around you, which is precisely, as you can see, what he did. Eventually, this building came into the possession of the university, um, and, and uh, the, we tore it down in the, eight, in the 1950s. And, um, and you can see that, you can see that horrible little building there. Uh, yeah, it was really, what it was was apartments and then commercial properties on the first floor. And um, here's the Eastman Theater. The Kodak Hall, as you now know it. And here's, this is that block. And, and I like to think that what we did when we opened up the East Wing, we dedicated it last year, that we finally completed what Mr. Eastman's original vision was. This is what it should, this is what he intended. Uh, and it now in 21st century architectural sensibilities is what it looks like. And I'd like to think that Mr. Eastman, wherever, he, wherever his spirit is, is probably looking down now and saying, well, it sure took you long enough. To get to, to complete my vision, to complete my dream. By the way, Mr. Eastman was a very, he was a very um, uh, kind of severe person. I mean, he was a pleasant enough man, but he was very formal. Rush Reese and and uh, President Reese and Mr. Eastman always referred to each other by uh, formally. And reading through the through the through their letters, it's always, dear Dr. Reese and dear Mr. Eastman. And it, but it's interesting because in 1925, they'd known each other for 25 years, had been involved in the creation of the Eastman School, the creation of the Medical Center, the, crea the creation of the, of the River Campus. It's after they had done all of that that the correspondence changes, and it's Dear Rush and Dear George. So 25 years before they would begin to re address each other uh, by their first names. The Medical Center was created in 1924-25 and it was George Eastman, I won't go into the whole story because we're running out of time, but George Eastman was the, was the prime mover by making an original gift of five million dollars. In 1925, five million dollars for the creation of a medical school in the hospital, which was supported also by, by external funding of comparable amounts and it was, it was just an astonishing accomplishment. This is our first dean of the, the founding dean of the medical school. Talk about inspired and effective leadership. George Whipple, George Whipple, who went on to to uh, uh, win the Nobel Prize in Medicine, and I call these the four horsemen of the medical apocalypse. Here we have pres uh, this is President Reese. This is Abraham Flexner, which I don't have time to go into how important he was. This is Mr. Eastman, and this is Dr. Whipple. This is the first dean of the nursing school. This is Helen Wood, for whom we have a building named over in the nursing school. Now I'm going to conclude here. This is an. Does anybody know what this is? Well, you see a body of water here. What's this body of water? It's the Genesee River. So, three guesses what that is. The the this this land, this land that we now know as the River Campus, had originally been Native American land. It had been land that the Iroquois and Senecas had inhabited, and before that, the Algonquins had inhabited that land. In 1901, it became the home of Oak Hill Country Club. And it was Oak Hill Country Club from 1901 to 1920, when through a series of swaps, a swap deal, the university acquired Oak Hill Country Club with the intention of, of relocating the downtown, the Prince Street campus, at least at a minimum, the college for, for men to the River Campus. By then we had the, the Strong Memorial Hospital and the School of Medicine and Dentistry, and so in a kind of gendered decision, which is ironic given our, given, given our, um, our, our diversity efforts, moved, picked up the College for Men to the River Campus where it could be next to medicine and guy stuff, and leaving the College for Women downtown with music in art. I mean, it was, as I've reflected on our history, um, there is a gendered dimension to it, to be sure. But we acquired this land, Oak Hill, through a series of swaps, and then the 1920s was a period in which the, the, the grand master plan for the creation of the river campus was made, and in the late 1920s, the construction took place. And you can see images of the construction of the river campus in the tunnel passage between, between Wilson Commons and the library. You know those big pictures that are on the wall there? You can see sort of what it looked like. So the next time you're walking through there, you can get some sense of what, a, what an enormous project it was. All these hills 
These hills had to all be, you know, the, the land had to be graded to make space to create it. And in 1930, the College for Men was moved to the River Campus, and the historical architectural trust of that move include the Eastman Quadrangle and the buildings on the Quadrangle, uh, Burton and Crosby residence halls, Rush Reese Library, and our athletic facilities. Those were the, those were the foundational buildings when we moved to the River Campus. In the 1920s, the Institute of Optics was founded. In the 1920s, we offered, we awarded our first PhD in 1925 our, in biochemistry. We awarded our second and third PhDs in 1927. The one recipient of whom, Vincent Duvigneau, in biochemistry in 1927, went on to win the Nobel Prize. All of which, I think, established and enunciated to the higher education world that the University of Rochester was going to be a major player in research higher education in the United States, which is, which has indeed what has happened. In 1932, George Eastman, in declining health, decided, being the man of, of, of great propriety and control, um, decided that the quality of his life was much more important than extending his life. And so after lengthy discussions with ethicists and with medical people, without making clear his plan, decided to take his own life. But before he did that, he called his attorneys to his mansion on East Avenue and he added a codicil to his will. And the codicil to his will left his estate to the University of Rochester. That estate at the time of his death was valued at $17 million. But when you add all of his gifts going back to that physics and biology building, all of his gifts exceed $51 million in 1932 dollars. If you adjust that for inflation, I think George Eastman arguably can be, can be identified as the single most generous individual contributor to American higher education. And then on a cold day in March, about midday, noon or so, he went up to his bedroom, which faces East Avenue to the left as you look at the building. He, he bid his housekeeper good day, went into his bedroom, smoked a final cigarette, wrote a note which said, my work is done, why wait? Sat up in bed, placed a handkerchief over his heart area, which he had researched, he had researched the location of his heart um, with, with great precision and with a single shot ended his life. Um, that what he and, and Rush Reese accomplished in that period set the stage going forward for who we were to become. There are many more stories that I could tell but I'm not going to because I said I'd leave, well, maybe two minutes at any rate for questions that you guys might have. But the stories, the stories continue because the leadership through our subsequent presidents. Alan Valentine succeeded Rush Rees, and Alan Valentine was our fourth president, and he shepherded us through two major difficult eras, the Great Depression and World War II. He was succeeded by Cornelius de Kiewit. We have a, we have a building name for de Kiewit. We have a building name for Valentine. De Kiewit saw to the, to the move of the College for Women to the River Campus. Uh, De Kiewit was followed by um, Alan Wallace, for whom Wallace Hall is named. And Alan Wallace really capitalized on uh, the availability, the post-World War II availability of external sources of funding for research. And so we became an even greater research university thanks to the faculty that Alan, President Alan Wallace brought to us. He was succeeded by Robert Sproul. And we have the Laboratory for Laser Energetics. We have him to thank for, the la for LLE, for the Laboratory for Laser Energetics. Do you know what that is? Oh, you got to find it. Just, 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 just Google it, okay? It is, it is one of the most, it is the second most powerful laser in the world. It's, it's, over, it's, over, it's over off of uh, 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 East River Road. Um, and he was followed by, uh, Sproul was followed by um, uh, Dennis O'Brien, who hired me as, as the Dean of Students. Uh, and followed by Tom Jackson, uh, and now with Joel Seligman. So uh, I am ever convinced even more strongly today, now that I know something about the past history, now that I know something about generations of students who are now alums, who I've had the privilege of, 
uh, being a part of their lives and as I associate with the current generation of students both in the classroom and outside of the classroom that the university is in really good hands. So with that let me put a pause on this and I've got about five minutes that I can answer questions. Yes? I have two questions actually. All right. Um, one is, I heard there used to be a tunnel at CV. <laughs> the famous uh, tunnel stories. <laughs> yeah. And also, I heard um, during the Manhattan Project, they did uh, human experimentation um, with uranium uh, uh, at the hospital. Yeah, okay, yeah. Right, there are tunnels all over this place, right? There are tunnels hither and yon. Some of them are pedestrian tunnels, and some of them are what I call pipes and wires tunnels. So there are tunnels that are available to traverse, which you do, and then there are tunnels that are really utility tunnels, and so they, they're they there. I mean, a tunnel, for example, between uh, the medical center and the river campus, there is a tunnel, but it's a pipes and wires tunnel. It's a utilities tunnel. So there are, the truth is that there are more tunnels than, than you have access to, but they weren't designed as, um, they weren't designed for pedestrian traffic. They were designed for utilities. As far as the Manhattan Project, yes, the university d did participate in the research uh, on the Manhattan Project. I do not know of human uh, subject experimentation. I do know of rat uh, experimentation. And so Eileen may know. Um, I, I, I don't know for sure. I did come across um, some articles, I think from the 70s, um, that there, there was some human experimentation in the lead. But I don't know if, if, if it's true or not. I, I, I can look into it more. Yeah, if you would, that'd be great. And you can check with Eileen because she's over in Rare Books. Um, th there has been controversy over the years about the rats. And, um, and that's because of what happened to the rats. You know, where are they? What was done to, to dispose of the rats? So there's been some controversy associated with all of that. But uh, if, I, I don't believe that human experimentation was, was uh, I've, never, I've not heard, I should put it this way, I have not heard that human experimentation was a central piece of our, the, our research effort with, uh, with the Manhattan Project. Yeah, Cordero. Yes. Um, you started the, uh, I guess, when did the rumor, I guess, start that if you walk under the, the clock, you won't graduate? <laughs> Which clock? The, the, the Dandelion Square. The Dandelion Square? <laughs> ah, that's great! You know, <laughs> you see, these are what are called campus myths, and I love that, how they get started. I have no idea how those things get started. I remember when that when that clock went up, and it's only been there. It's only been there for a short period of time. I mean that that clock has been there maybe 15 years, but no more than that. So, I, and actually, I hadn't heard that particular myth, but it's as good as any of the others, right? It's like it's, there's the myth about about the statue of Martin Brewer Anderson that. Um, that he has to be able to see the tower of Rush Reese Library, you know. Or there's another one that the Interfaith Chapel is on the other side of Wilson Boulevard because George Eastman's will specifically prohibited there being any religious religious buildings on the river camp. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> it's not true. But 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 those but those myths uh, they they um, they continue, which is which is just fine. But that one's new to me. I hadn't heard that if you walk into the clock, you won't graduate. Yeah. That's cool, man. That, that's see, see, they do that to scare you half to death, right? <laughs> Perpetuate these myths. You need to talk to the Meridians. Oh, the Meridians perpetuate? But you know what? Why not? You know? I mean, I, like, I would say, that's cool. That, you know, it, it makes things kind of interesting, you know? It's like, oh, man, you know, you, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, 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 and if you're brand new, you tend to believe. See, by the time you get to be where you are, you know, you know to believe only half of what you see and none of what you hear, right? <laughs> but when you're brand new, it's like, man, uh, maybe I better believe it because you never know, right? So, yeah. Um, I heard from President Seligman that Eastman asked Rushries, do you want a music school or a law school? And he picked the music school. Is there any truth to that? Not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. Uh, his His interest in the music uh, you see the music school George Eastman's interest in the music school was driven powerfully by his own interest in music he, he referred to himself as a musical moron George Eastman did 
but he was a great lover of music and so he wanted to extend the love of music that he had to the community and over the over the um, the Eastman Theater in, embedded in the in the uh, uh, in, you know at the top of the Eastman Theater outside it says for the enrichment of the Roch, uh, for the enrichment of the community so the interest in creating a music school that was that was in, that was entirely George Eastman's interest, and discussions about a law school have come up over time. But in every instance that I've seen it in the literature, um, it's been I, Rush Reese talked about it. Rush Reese talked about having a law school and said no, and it's it we're not going to do we're not going down that road because. This is after Eastman was established because the resources, he, he's, th this baby that we have created uh, is so expensive. In fact, it was George Eastman actually refers to the baby that was left on our doorstep, which is the Eastman School and the medical school. So I, it, I have not seen any, um, I've not seen anything in the literature to suggest that a law school was actively contemplated. Um, now. President Wallace, uh, Alan Wallace, uh, this is much later of course, he very much wanted a law school and in fact a fundraising campaign was initiated to raise money to establish a law school. That fundraising came was, campaign was unsuccessful and so the Wallace Institute and Political Science Department, the resources that were raised for the law school unsuccessfully went to the Wallace Institute in Political Science. Yeah. I don't believe so. I don't believe so. Uh, there used to be a myth that he didn't want to have the Eastman School named for him. Untrue. He, uh, he. Uh, what's really interesting is when you read the you read the correspondence. That was Mr. Eastman School, and I'm telling you, he he watched over that school and he was involved in its management. Well, here's a great story. The first director of the Eastman School, we now call Dean, the first director of the Eastman School was Alf Klingenberg, the K of DKG, Institute of Musical Art. And he had a five-year contract from 1918 to 1923. Mr. Eastman was displeased. He ran afoul of George Eastman. Mr. Eastman was displeased with, his, with uh, Klingenberg's administration. Now, Eastman was not a trustee, University trustee. He was not a dean. He had no academic credentials, but he fired Alf Klingenberg. <laughs> and I've seen the letter. <laughs> and the letter, whew, you know, I mean, it would a letter like that would sort of curl, you know, curdle my blood. But, uh, but so he was perfectly happy to have his school, his music school, named for him. And then one, when it came to the River Campus, the 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 trustees. Um, uh, passed a resolution naming the Eastman Quadrangle for him and in the correspondence that I've seen between Eastman and Reese about the naming I see no uh, uh, no I, I don't see Mr. Eastman uh, at, at any point objected to that so um, you know he I think he recognized that um, all of this was in no small uh, measure to his far-sightedness and his generosity and it was kind of interesting too the one thing I'll say about his willing the resources he gave to the university at some level in 1932 he must have known that the future was in the creation of knowledge not in the production of film he must have known that and indeed that's that is the case I came across a letter in, in the correspondence where we had a, our first major capital campaign was 1924 and he was involved in that. It was a ten million dollar campaign and he wrote to a colleague uh, seeking subscription to the campaign, asking for a donation. A businessman here in town, the businessman work, wrote, wrote to him and said, uh, dear, my dear George, uh, I got your letter asking me for a pledge for the campaign. I'm not going to, I'm not going to accede to your request because I don't think that um, I don't, because you know that we don't look for college men for our talent 
in the, in the business world. Eastman wrote back to him, this was 1924, Eastman wrote back to him and said, ah, I used to think the way you did, but I don't think that way anymore. And now, when we are looking for talent for the Eastman Kodak Company, the first place we go to are colleges. And so when he took his life in 1932, at some point, he, he must have been prescient because he knew that the future lay in the production of knowledge and not in the production of film. Eastman Kodak Company in 1981 employed 62,000 people in, the, in Rochester. There was 60 to 62,000. I've heard it's about 60,000 people. In 1980, 81. In 2011, it employs fewer than 7,000 people. And um, the University of Rochester is the largest employer. So it's really kind of interesting to sort of look back and and, and see the, the premonition that he must have had about what the future was going to be. Ma'am. So when did Mount Hope Cemetery come about? Um, Mount Hope Cemetery, I, it's not part of the university. And I'm not sure when it was established, except I will tell you it's the oldest urban cemetery in the United States. And so I, that's, that's a subject that awaits me. You know who will know that, though, is Professor Homer. Anybody here taking Speaking Stones? Taking this course, Speaking Stones? That's, that's a place that you might look. In fact, what I would suggest you do is go to his Speaking Stones website because it's fabulous. It's got all his student papers. He's, got, he's uploaded all of his student papers there. And you can also go to the Mount Hope Cemetery website and they'll, they'll give you the history of when it started. I don't really know. I will tell you that there are many of many people associated with the university throughout its history who are buried there. I, I periodically go and just wander through through the uh, the cemetery because it you know I, I really enjoy very much seeing where the remains of some of these important people are. Well, gang, thanks for putting up with me. <laughs> thanks for letting me tell the story because I love telling these stories, and now you know. And when you are the president of the University of Rochester, right? You know what your responsibility is? To tell this story, right? Because you see, I will have taken up residence. <laughs> I will have taken up residence, you know, in that spot on the other side of, of, uh, of uh, Intercampus Drive, you know, where the, <laughs> where the apartments go down, not up. So I'm, <laughs> so I'm counting on you to come over to my apartment where I will have, the rent will be paid. You don't have to worry about that. And say, hey, Dean Regret, you know what? You were right. I am the president of the University of Rochester. Thanks, thanks gang. Thank you.